In late 1995, Batman fans would finally rejoice as Dick Grayson was finally given his own solo series under the guise of Nightwing. Grayson had adopted the mantle of Nightwing in the classic Teen Titans story The Judas Contract. During that time, Dick had had a falling out with Batman. Depending on which continuity you read, he either had an incident where, as Robin, he had been shot, or Grayson had grown frustrated and wanted a more mature identity as a hero. The name Nightwing came from a figure in Kryptonian mythology who was cast out of his family and swore an oath to protect the helpless. Again, depending on which continuity you read, Dick had either come across the story during an adventure in the bottled city of Kandor, or Superman had relayed the old Kryptonian myth to him. Nightwing's solo series revolved around him relocating from Gotham City to the nearby city of Bloodhaven, where corruption was rampant thanks to the fact the entire city was under the control of a villainous crime kingpin named Blockbuster. Now, from time to time, Dick could be called back to Gotham City to film for Batman, which is some of the events revolving around today's story. Also, a few years before Nightwing got his solo series, Batman readers would be introduced to a new incarnation of the Huntress. The original Huntress was a Golden Age supervillain named Paula Brooks, who later came to be known under the name of Tigress. Then, in the 1970s, the mantle would be taken up by Helena Wayne, the daughter of the parallel universe Bruce Wayne and Selina Kyle Wayne. Helena lived in the Earth-2 universe of the Justice Society of America. After the Crisis on Infinite Earths event removed Earth-2 from the DC Universe continuity, Helena Wayne became Helena Bertinelli, daughter of a Gotham City mafioso who swore a blood oath against the Mafia after her entire family was taken out in a hit. This new Huntress really doesn't subscribe to Batman's no-kill policy, which has led to quite a bit of tension with the rest of the Bat family, though she would temporarily assume the mantle of Batgirl during a storyline called No Man's Land. In 1998, it was decided that Nightwing and the Huntress would team up for a four-issue miniseries. And now, it's time we finally spoke about the artist for today's story, Greg Land. Land is part of an art movement that relies very heavily on photo referencing. Now, there's nothing wrong with using photo reference per se. For example, Alex Ross is a highly regarded artist who uses photo reference. The difference is, Ross uses photo reference the way an art class uses models. He has someone make a pose and then tries his best to recreate the pose on the paper. Conversely, Greg Land and his ilk use a device called a light box to project the image of the photograph onto their artboard and then they basically trace around the image to create it almost exactly. Greg Land in particular has become notorious because his primary photo reference is porn. This has led to many of his female characters having what could best be described as an O-face. Oh, 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 you know what I'm... Now, I'd like to say that today's story takes place before Land really began relying on porn as a reference, but this is what the first page looks like. Yeah, so, um... Here's Nightwing Huntress. At Gotham Starlight Hotel, a woman is attacked by a guy who believes she let him on. She tries to explain the situation, but he bashes her skull against a wall, killing her instantly. Across town, mobster Frankie Black is preparing for a major arms deal when he's surprised by two things. The first is the sudden appearance of his fiancée, Moira McAllister. The second is his partner, Pasquale, informing him of the dead woman being found in a room at the Starlight Hotel registered in his name. And therein lies the problem. Frankie Black works for the Malfatti crime family. However, the deal is with a rival group, the Russos. Frankie having a room at the Starlight was supposed to be a cover for his whereabouts. Now his alibi needs an alibi. Unbeknownst to the mobsters, Nightwing has actually been staking them out for a while and has been privy to this entire conversation. Back at the Starlight, the Huntress looks on as Detective Harvey Bullock questions Mason, the first officer on the scene, about why he knew that Frankie Black was at the Starlight. Mason says that he got a tip from a streetwalker that was confirmed by the Registar. Bullock then puts out an APB for Frankie Black. It doesn't take too long for Frankie to be located, and he's chosen to scuttle his deal with the Russos and turn himself in. The Russos arrive at the warehouse, only to be taken out by Nightwing. Nightwing then heads over to the police precinct, where he bumps into Huntress, who initially mistakes him for Batman. She then thinks that Nightwing is some type of watchdog sent to keep her in check. But that's not the case at all. He's actually here to clear Frankie Black. Huntress isn't too pleased with Nightwing's revelation, but he points out that while Frankie Black should be in prison, it shouldn't be for a crime he didn't commit. Also, maybe if they work together, more than Frankie could be taken down, like even Malfatti himself. The two head over to the crime scene at the Starlight Hotel. Nightwing points out that this couldn't have been a mob hit as it's way too messy. He also points out that the Huntress has great abilities as a crime fighter, but like Batman, he disapproves of many of her methods, and she needs to see the bigger picture. Huntress begins wondering if Nightwing's interest is a bit more than professionally motivated as she plants a big smooch on him and 
and points out that the mob family she grew up in is not entirely different from the Bat family that he grew up in. Meanwhile, Harvey Bullock is visited by a detective Ellison from the Vice Squad. Ellison has some questions about the whereabouts of his partner, who just turned up dead in a room at the Starlight Motel, registered to Frankie Black. Harvey Bullock is a Gotham City police detective known for using excessive force during interrogation as a technique and also for looking the other way on organized crime from time to time, which has led to rumors to him being on the take, though he steadfastly denies receiving any money. He's also vehemently opposed to the actions of Batman and the Bat family in general, though he does put up a rough tolerance out of a sense of loyalty to Commissioner Jim Gordon. Ellison explains that his partner, whose name was Caitlin, was obsessed with bringing down the Malfatti crime family and went undercover against orders. Meanwhile, Malfatti himself appears at Moira's apartment while Nightwing and Huntress track down Pasquale for more information. Unfortunately, things start off on the wrong foot as Huntress wants to beat the information on Pasquale and Nightwing is forced to talk her down. They do manage to get some information. Frankie was actually looking to get out of the Mafia, using the arms deal as a mistake that he would pay back for and thus free himself. That way, he could marry Moira and give her a normal life. Except now it's not in the cards, as Malfatti shows up at the jail to inform Frankie that Moira is with him, and shortly after that, he winds up breaking Frankie out. Meanwhile, Officer Mason overhears the word that the body at the starlight was that of an undercover cop. He rushes into the evidence room where he bumps smack dab into the Huntress as he rifles through the evidence found at the starlight. Mason explains that Frankie Black is his caller, and if he's let free, Black will put Mason number one on the hit list. He passes along the information that Caitlin was an undercover cop to the Huntress, and she in turn passes that information along to Nightwing. Nightwing then confesses that it's been nice working with Huntress. Working solo is fine, but it can get lonely. She admits the feeling of loneliness is mutual, and the two begin kissing once more. The two head back to Helena's apartment where they wind up having sex. Afterwards, Dick learns Helena's identity as a school teacher. He had discerned this earlier as she was constantly correcting his grammar earlier. He then gets a call from Barbara Gordon, aka Oracle, who's wondering why Dick is at the Huntress's home, naked, with no clothes on. Okay, so in the Nightwing solo series around this time, the creators were pursuing the idea of a romance between Dick Grayson and Barbara Gordon. Something that seems like it should have been building for a long time in the comics, but wasn't really the case. See, when Barbara Gordon initially debuted as Batgirl, she was pretty firmly a college student, somewhere around the age of 20, while Dick Grayson was around the age of about 15, barely just about to enter high school. In fact, the idea of them be having any sort of romantic feelings towards each other wasn't even pursued until the Batman animated series altered their ages to be a bit more contemporary. So, yeah, Dick suddenly out of nowhere hooking up with the Huntress does seem a bit awkward, and it does stick in Babs' craw for a while. Dick tries to get Oracle to look up any information on the Malfatti hiding houses, as he suspects a breakout may have just occurred. But she's more focused on pointing out the Freudian nature of his hookup, as Huntress isn't too entirely different from Batman. Helena intervenes, and Dick ends the call, making sure not to reveal his identity. This sticks in Helena's craws. It seems that most of the Bat family seems to know who she is, but she doesn't know who any of them are. And it is further evidence that Nightwing does not fully trust her. The two then split up to find further information. Nightwing goes to some of the women who normally work the Starlight. One admits that Frankie Black had actually requested for her to be in the room, but Caitlin paid her $200 to switch places, and she went into the Starlight with a uniformed officer not too far behind. Meanwhile, Frankie is dropped off at a safe house outside of Gotham where Moira is waiting. Now, Fatty then goes to a different restaurant to talk with Pasquale, only for Huntress to interrupt. She says that new evidence has turned up that ties Pasquale to the murder, unless, of course, he sells out Frankie. Now, Fatty suggests that Pasquale turn himself in. Pasquale turns himself over, but Nightwing points out to Detective Ellison there's no way Pasquale could have killed Caitlin, as he's too short to have caused the damage in the room in the way it was presented. He also informs the detective about the uniformed police officer who followed Caitlin into the starlight. Detective Ellison goes to Officer Mason to see if the go-getter has anything new. Mason mentions seeing a bloody pillowcase that forensics mentioned was missing. Funny thing, Mason hasn't actually seen the forensics report, or at least he wasn't supposed to have seen the forensics report. Having probable cause, Ellison has a search of Mason's locker conducted, which turns up the bloody pillowcase. Unfortunately, while Bullock and Ellison begin arguing over the legality of Ellison's actions, Mason slips out, forcibly commandeers a squad vehicle, and begins tailing the recently released Pasquale. Meanwhile, the Huntress uses her knowledge of the Mafia to locate Malfatti's safe house. It's in his sister's name. It's a ways out of town, so Huntress wonders if Nightwing wasn't the only thing Batman left behind in Gotham. Funny thing, at one point Nightwing actually did have his own vehicle called the Nightbird, but obviously that's not what the Huntress is talking about, and you're probably just expecting me to make the joke, so here you go. Chicks dig the car.
Unfortunately for Huntress, they don't use the Batmobile or the Nightbird. Just a Ferrari. Along the way, they discuss Frankie's plan on getting out of the family. Helena points out that it really wouldn't have worked. The only way to leave the Mafia without any strings attached or any possible threat of them returning is in a body bag. Back with Officer Mason, he explains what happened to his partner before killing the man when they see where Pasquale is going. He tried to elicit some favors from Caitlin instead of busting her, as he didn't believe her story about being an undercover cop. When she started to fight back, everything snowballed, and now his only hope is to bring down the whole Malfati crime family. Or so he thinks. Nightwing and Huntress arrive at the safe house around the same time as Pasquale and Mason. They peer through the window as Frankie and Moira embrace. She's certain that the two will finally have their freedom as Malfatti has promised. But Frankie knows the truth. Like Helena said earlier, the only way to leave the Mafia with no strings attached is in a body bag. With that, Frankie pulls out a gun and kills Moira. Huntress looks on as Frankie exits through the front door of the house to be confronted by Mason and Pasquale. Meanwhile, Nightwing goes after Malfatti. Just as it looks like Frankie will be killed by either Pasquale or Mason, Huntress intervenes and takes out all three men just as the police arrive. Everyone, save for Nightwing and Huntress, gets arrested. A few days later, a disguised Dick Grayson visits Helena Bertinelli at her school with some flowers. He has news that Frankie Black has agreed to testify against Malfatti. Helena is still upset, though. She's still looking for trust from the Bat family. Again, they seem to know her identity, but she doesn't know any of theirs. Dick says that trust will come with time, and he's still looking forward to possibly having a relationship. But Helena's not interested and says their tryst was just a one-time thing. Nightwing's okay with that, but does point out again that more respect will come with time. And so concludes Nightwing Huntress. How was it? Well, on the plus side, I did like the character interactions in this, particularly between Nightwing and Huntress themselves, especially after they hook up with Dick thinking this is the start of some possible romance and Helena having to explain to them that sometimes casual sex is just a thing. And Greg Land's art is not bad, or at least not as bad as it would become known for in recent years, though that could actually be because of Bill Sienkiewicz having to ink him rather than him inking himself. I don't really know. On the downside, though, uh, this story feels really, really rushed. Like, this thing was meant to be six issues and somehow got cut down to four, because there's chunks of this that just feel missing. I mean, Nightwing and the Huntress, for a story called Nightwing Huntress, don't really do much in it. I mean, I know I dwell a lot on them sleeping together, but that's because it's really the only noteworthy thing. Also, the villains are really flat. I mean... They're just kind of uninspired. I mean, you could do the Mafia angle. I don't mind that. But maybe use one of the more prominent mafiosos in Gotham, like Carmine Falcone or Rupert Thorne or, heck, even the Penguin. I think the story would have been much richer for it. And, again, Nightwing and the Huntress don't do much in a story called Nightwing and the Huntress. And it's for that reason I unfortunately have to give Nightwing Huntress a D. And this is a shame, too, because this is written by a woman named Devin Grayson and... Her run on Nightwing is actually one of the things that helped get me back into comics on a regular basis. So, yeah, it's kind of disappointing. Anyway, let's see what we'll be doing next time on the Random Trade Review. guys, got a request for the show? Check out my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash sleepy time for cat productions. And if you like the video, give it a like, share it, subscribe, and ring that notification bell.